very good morning and a good day to all of you and welcome to this lecture on oral cancer uh, this is a two-part series and uh, we'll be covering the lecture in uh, part so one the learning outcomes uh, would be two. to define potentially malignant disorders of the oral cavity and list at least five of them detect clinically potentially malignant disorders and oral cancer and guide the patient towards preventive therapy or appropriate referral. So that's a very strong learning outcome here, which is expected uh, from uh, year four and year five students, basically dental graduates. Explain in detail etiopathogenesis, clinical features, latest diagnostic workup, differential diagnosis, and treatment of potentially malignant disorders and oral cancer. Classify squamous cell carcinoma based on TNM staging and describe the complications of oral cancer treatment and treatment of mucositis. Right, so uh, let me just uh, give you some introduction of statistics here. Oral cancer is the sixth most common cancer worldwide and uh, 90 to 92 to 95% of them are oral malignant, of all the oral malignancies are squamous cell carcinomas. The five-year survival rate for cancer is directly related to the stage at which the initial diagnosis is made. The survival rate of oral cancer uh, victim is lower than that of a cervical cancer, skin melanoma or breast cancer. So it goes without saying that uh, earlier the diagnosis, better the prognosis. S annually there are about 350 thousand new cases reported worldwide when you look at this picture what comes to your mind elderly gentleman with uh, probably a nasal feeding tube and you can see that there's a large uh, defect left in the maxilla uh, and you can see the internal structures possibly post treatment or, or after surgical treatment of uh, cancer of the head and neck region and where part of the jaw has to be excised and you can also see there are surgical scars in the neck and the nasal region. So the impact of uh, oral cancer and head and neck cancer per se can be quite uh, debilitating. Uh, you can see that uh, patients have difficulty in speech, in um, deglutition and performing daily activities and it can be quite um, a stressful condition to uh, recover from not only physically but also mentally when we're talking about potentially malignant disorders we are already aware that all precancerous lesions and precancerous conditions have now been combined to form into one big group called as potentially malignant disorders the, these disorders are the ones in which the risk of malignancy being present in the lesion or condition either at time of initial diagnosis or at a future date. That means when you see a lesion and it, you classify it as a potentially malignant disorder, that means that it, it looks like it could be the initial diagnosis of malignancy and the patient might be at risk of malignancy or could be at risk of malignancy in future date. That means the lesion itself is not malignant but it can potentially turn malignant. The classification again if you were to look at OPMDs earlier the lesions precancerous lesions were leukoplakia, erythroplakia and palatal lesions in reverse smoking and the conditions that means which affect a larger area are submucous fibrosis, acnic keratosis, lichen planus, discoid lupus erythematosus. But now we categorize all of these together as one common group called as OPMDs, which are potentially oral potentially malignant disorders. The etiology can be various and they have been classified into extrinsic factors and intrinsic factors. The extrinsic factors, the most commonest one is tobacco. Uh, in the form of smoking or chewing or both alcohol which has a synergistic action along with tobacco the risk of smokers who are also heavy drinkers is 6 to 15 times that of those who do not have alcohol or tobacco 
viral infection which can also act as an initiating factor for potentially malignant disorders are HPV, EBV, HBV that is hepatitis B, HIV and HSV as well, herpes simplex virus, so HPV is human papilloma virus. Bacteria like Tryponema pallidum, fungal infections like Candidiasis, electrogalvanic reactions between unlike restorative materials which is now less common, UV radiation giving rise to lip lesions, chronic irritation or trauma can act as a tissue modifier rather than a, a true carcinogen itself. Intrinsic factors are genetic, about 5% uh, cancers are hereditary. Immune suppression like organ transplant or HIV which make the patient more susceptible to have a malignant disorder, a potentially malignant disorder. Malnourishment like anemia or vitamin deficiencies. Moving on, this slide I would consider as one of the most important slides in this entire chapter and one of the most important take home messages. These are the factors associated with increased risk of malignant transformation in a potentially malignant disorder. So first of all, <clears throat> what is it? Red and white intermixed lesion or presence of multiple lesions. That means a person who's having one uh, area of red and white mixed lesion versus a person who's having two areas or more areas. The one who's having one lesion is less likely transforming into malignancy than the person who has more lesions. Proliferative verrucous surface appearance or presence of nodule erosion, ulceration or presence of candidiasis. Any of these uh, le uh, features make the lesion more susceptible and having an increased risk of malignant transformation. Lesions seen in non-smokers, right? So a passive smoker will have a greater risk for transformation of a malignant lesion than the one who uh, than the one who is already a smoker that means a lesion when seen in a non-smoker or the person who has no habits has a higher risk of malignant transformation all right so the question here is how did the person get the lesion in the first place when they are non-smokers or they're having no habits so that's the reason why that kind of a patient becomes uh, someone who is at a higher risk Lesions not regressing after habit cessation or after the causative initial factor is removed or continuation of habit after initial diagnosis. That means if there is a patient who has a lesion and the lesion has not shown any change even after the person has left the habit or after the causative initiating factor, let's say a sharp tooth was removed or if the patient has started to continue the habit after you have diagnosed him or her as having leukoplakia then these kind of patients or these kind of lesions have an increased risk of malignant transformation duration of lesion before initial diagnosis longer the duration poorer the prognosis so a patient who's had a recent lesion three months ago has less chances of malignant transformation as compared to a patient who has a lesion let's say since two years ago lesion size greater than 200 millimeter square or two centimeters in size right so a lesion if you're looking at a red and white lesion which is already two centimeters in size then definitely it is an indicator that it has a higher chance of malignant transformation and hence should be biopsied immediately Re high risk anatomic site so lesions present on the floor of the mouth lateral posterior border of the tongue and lip have a higher chance of malignant transformation now the reason for this could be related to the vascular supply of this area but otherwise <clears throat> lesions seen on these areas generally have a higher chance of malignant transformation the next is younger aged diagnosis now this is a very tricky one in fact, and it's very difficult to understand how this happens actually, that a person who is at a younger age and gets diagnosed with a potentially malignant disorder is at a higher risk for malignant transformation than someone who is much older in age. 
right so that is something to be uh, taken care of so next time you see a patient who's come to you with a leukoplakia and is relatively younger at age the prognosis of that lesion is poorer than someone who gets diagnosed with leukoplakia at the age of 60 and lastly for unknown reasons female gender when a lesion is seen in female versus that of a male they have 47 percent of higher chance that it shows malignant transformation so which is again uh, not a very good sign so that means if you're seeing a white lesion in um, a 40 year old male versus a 40 year old female then the female has a higher chance of malignant transformation as compared to the male patient so <clears throat> this a slide is uh, hence a very important slide and forms um, an important key factors that he help you diagnose clinically and also making clinical decisions and uh, let me give you another important tip that this slide is often used as the basis for making uh, OSCE questions so I would want you to pay more attention to this slide so let's just look at some of the um, lesions, potentially malignant disorders, which you have already seen in the previous chapter. Let's just go through them again. Right, for uh, example, this is leukoplakia. You will see here that there are three different types of leukoplakia here. One of them is the usual homogeneous, cracked mud, white appearance, non-scrapable lesion. The one seen here is slightly raised um, and giving a thicker appearance, more towards a non-homogeneous variant. And this is again non-homogeneous, which is a very thick area, plaque-like appearing like PVL or proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. More pictures of proliferative varicose leukoplakia and speckled leukoplakia, which is also a non-homogeneous type where you're seeing both red and white mixed appearance here. So these lesions are more likely to be malignant, uh, have a chance for malignant transformation than a simple white leukoplakia. That's what is what the essence of the previous slide was. So when you're looking at steps in diagnosis of oral leukoplakia, this is a small um, modification to the Van der Waal um, table that we've already familiar with. When you're looking at a white patch or plaque, first of all, you would like to exclude other known conditions or disorders uh, based on history or examination. That means, can it be scraped off? Could it be due to friction or could it be... Um, looking like some other white lesion genetically uh, or ge genetically induced or you're already down with a provisional clinical diagnosis of leukoplakia after you have ruled out the possibility of other lesions. So when you know you're looking at a case of leukoplakia, it's important that the biopsy is done uh, so that other known disorders are excluded. Now, if you, after the biopsy, it turns out to be another known disorder, very good. Like, for example, it turns out to be a white sponge nevus or it turns out to be frictional keratosis, then you revise your diagnosis and treat the patient accordingly. But in case it does turn out to be leukoplakia, on biopsy, you will, uh, it will be epithelial keratinization with dysplasia or without dysplasia. So I would like to remind all of you here again that leukoplakia is a clinical diagnosis and not a histopathology diagnosis because it's a, a white lesion which you see clinically. On the histopathology, this chart doesn't mention it, of course, it would appear as a uh, a keratinized area with dysplasia or without dysplasia and based on that excision and follow-up is decided so this is a very short form of the larger chart you could make various um, versions of this chart depending on the case that you are looking at and come up with the diagnosis as well as the detailed treatment plan Moving on, the treatment of oral potentially malignant disorders, let's say you're looking at le uh, leukoplakia or erythroplakia, first of all is to reduce risk factors, discontinue habit, uh, surgical excision with uh, or laser excision, then uh, you should keep in mind that the lesions have malignant transformation of 1 to 20 percent over 1 to 30 years. Of course, that of erythroplakia is a lot more higher and follow up. The follow-up part is very important. If the patient needs to be uh, re-examined. Uh, the site has to be re-examined every three months for the first year. Uh, if there are no changes or no relapse, follow-up uh, once every six months. And take a new biopsy if new clinical lesion is seen. Again, very important. That means you're seeing a newer lesion in a different uh, area or even in the same area. 
and if there are no relapses after five years and the patient can be on self-examination otherwise continued follow-up is recommended When it comes to other potentially malignant disorder, uh, disorders like lichen planus or DLE, of course, symptomatic treatments, uh, steroids and adjuncts have to be implemented. Uh, we will not be covering this in detail because we have already looked at these lesions in the previous uh, red and white lesion chapter. And OFM OSMF as well, that is oral submucous fibrosis. Uh, quitting habits and your various methods of treatment like fibrinolytics, steroids, placentrix, antioxidants. This is again uh, an example of potentially not a potentially malignant disorder which is oral hair leukoplakia. It's a viral in origin caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Palatal lesions in reverse smoking leading to erythroplakia. We've seen this image before. This requires immediate biopsy and has a very high rate of malignant transformation. Lichen planus as seen bilaterally. This is a case of ulcerative lichen planus with also some plaque like areas. DLE disc like mixed red and white lesion. And this is frank oral squamous cell carcinoma. We're seeing a ulceroproliferative growth here or an ulceration here with the growth uh, and also an ulceration center of the tongue, lateral border of the tongue with definite. Uh, raised border. So this is a clear example of how squamous cell carcinoma looks like. So um, when you are diagnosing clinically, there are various diagnostic aids in the detection of oral pot potentially malignant disorder as well as head and neck cancer. So let us look at some uh, most common uh, clinical methods of uh, uh, available methods of diagnostics. Right, so the first one and the gold standard still remains to be conventional oral examination. There's nothing like looking at your naked eye, looking looking at a lesion through your naked eye, and then arriving at a diagnosis. Right, so there are other clinical methods like vital staining as well, which we will look at uh, in the forthcoming slides. Optical methods, Visilite, Microlux, Bellscope, and uh, fluorescence uh, stereoscopy. Imaging methods, which is useful if you're already suspecting that it has become cancer and it has spread to adjacent areas, then you would want to do imaging. Could be computer tomography, MRI, positron emission tomography, scintigraphy, photoactive imaging, optical coherence tomography, narrowband imaging, nanodiagnostics, other methods of diagnosing. Continuing histopathology remains again a very important method of diagnosis, gold standard being scalpel biopsy, uh, followed by you have oral CDX which is a brush biopsy test which is uh, um, verified against a set um, uh, criteria already available. Then you uh, have a cytology, a smear, laser capture micro dissection. Then comes salivary diagnostic methods like protein electrophoresis, silochemistry, if you're looking at changes in the salivary glands or salivary gland is the primary area of uh, cancer. Molecular methods, immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, polymerized chain reaction. Of course, for all of this, you will need a tissue sample, either blood or um, a biopsy sample, blotting techniques, spectral chirotyping. Um, <clears throat> silver nor, then fluorescent in situ hybridization, DNA microarray, and comparative genomic hybridization. So the, these are all various methods of diagnosing which are available and used for uh, oral cancers and head and neck cancer. Let's look at vital staining uh, by to uh, toledine blue. Uh, toledine blue is a chemical which is available and can be used for staining the oral mucosal tissue clinically. That's why the term vital staining. That means it's done on a, not on a sample of a tissue but on a patient who's sitting on your chair. Right? So the steps for this are ask the patient to rinse them out with water to take away any debris. Apply toledine blue stain on the area that you are, uh, it looks suspicious. Rinse uh, with 1% acetic acid and then observe the areas which have retained the stain which would essentially be like this. this is a picture which I have taken from the textbook which shows you that this is a suspected area and they have uh, stained it with um, toledine blue right and so obviously the lesion which looks um, suspicious is, is very clinically detectable but the advantage of doing the staining is that the areas or the extent of the lesion which cannot be really clinically uh, 
diagnosed is also stained so it gives you an idea how extensive the lesion actually is and that means all of this entire area is part of the lesion that is um, <coughs> suspicious so that is how toluidine blue stain is used so step one step two staining step three is acetic acid and step four observing the stain which is retained the area which have retained the uh, stain moving on to visilite visilite is a technique of chemiluminescence it's a small um, stick like um, instrument which uh, glows and you're able to visualize uh, the uh, areas which need a biopsy so normal epithelium absorbs visilite illumination and appears dark abnormal epithelium absorbs visilite illumination and appears white so obviously the whitish area is the one that needs to be looked at like pre-cancer and which needs a biopsy so that's what is explained in this image here Wellscope. We used to have a wellscope instrument some time ago, but again, um, it is only useful as an adjunct and may not be a sole method of diagnosis. Uh, the oral uh, examination still remains the primary goal uh, or a gold standard. So, normal epithelium produces fluorescence and appears as apple glow. So, this has a blue light which, is sh uh, sh which we shine on the tissue. And then if the lesion is normal, it appears apple color. Whereas, abnormal epithelium shows loss of fluorescence. So, if you see this very dark area here, this shows that the area is abnormal. Whereas, normal area tissue around it appears apple green. So, the center which is having a lesion which is very dark in color is the area where biopsy is required moving on to narrowband imaging it is an endoscopic optical imaging enhancement technology that improves the contrast of mucosal surface texture and enhances visualization of mucosal and submucosal vasculature so you this is is uh, related to the wavelength of light that penetrates the lesion and is reflected back and the uh, imaging method is able to capture that again this is also a clinical test which can be used um, with the help of an endoscope and is done especially in ENT settings to look at the larynx the pharynx and uh, areas which are difficult to examine clinically if you were to look at the staging of oral squamous cell carcinoma you are already aware of this staging uh, let's just go through the staging which is given by the american joint committee on cancer uh, in detail tx is a primary tumor which cannot be uh, assessed t0 is there is no evidence of primary tumor tis is carcinoma in situ t1 tumor is two centimeters or less in greatest dimension T2 tumor is more than 2 centimeters but not greater than 4 centimeters in greatest dimension. T3 tumor is more than 4 cm in greatest dimension. And T4, let's say for example, lip tumor invades through cortical bone, inferior alveolar nerve, floor of the mouth, or skin surface that is the chin or nose. T4A oral tumor invades adjacent structures through cavity, cortical bone, into deep extrinsic muscle of tongue all of the muscles and also uh, maxillary sinus skin of the face t4b tumor invades masticatory space pterygoid plates or skull base or uh, or encases the internal carotid artery so important to note that superficial erosion alone of bone or tooth socket by gingiva uh, primary is gingival primary that means a lesion which is appearing first in the gingiva is not sufficient to classify as t4 so you will have to go back and classify it as a t3 right and we're looking at n neck nodes staging and x is the regional lymph node cannot be assessed and zero there is no regional lymph node metastasis it means you're sure that there's no regional lymph node metastasis and one metastasis in a single ipsilateral that is same side as the lesion uh, three centimeters or less in greatest dimension and two metastasis in a single ipsilateral node more than three centimeters but not more than six in greatest uh, dimension or metastasis is in multiple ipsilateral nodes none more than 6 cm in greatest dimension or metastasis is in bilateral both sides 
or contralateral that means lesion is on the right side but the lymph node on the left side is palpable um, but none greater than 6 cm in latest dimension there's a more further classification which is n2a and n2b and n2c and depending how the lymph nodes are uh, visible n3 is metastasis uh, is in a lymph node more than 6 cm in greatest dimension Lastly, the M of the TNM classification, which is distant uh, metastasis. MX is distant metastasis, cannot be assessed. M0 with no distance metastasis. M1 with distance metastasis at any site in the rest of the body. So this is the TNM staging. Stage 0 is when TIS or N0, M0. Stage 1 is T1, N0, M0. Stage 2, T2, N0, M0. Stage 3, T3. N0, M0, T1, N1, M0, T2, N1, M0 or T3, N1, M0. So um, more like T3, stage 3, probably easier for you to uh, remember the classification. Stage 4, A, B and C is again classified based on the uh, lesion. I will not go into the details. I hope you can understand how the grouping is. So the grading of squamous cell carcinoma is again just a modified broadest classification. This is not the same as staging. This is a histopathological classification, grading of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, G1, grade 1 is well differentiated, 2 is moderately differentiated, poor, uh, 3 is poorly differentiated and 4 is undifferentiated. So we all know very well that a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma is easier and has a better prognosis than that which is poorly differentiated. Looking at the five year survival rate, now this is not a very good picture which shows you that uh, how many patients can survive after five years. So the five year survival rate for a mobile tongue cancer, someone who's having a tongue which is still moving uh, after, at the end of um, uh, five years, uh, only 15% of patients who are diagnosed in stage four actually survive right so but if they are diagnosed at stage one then 80 percent of the patients can survive at the end of five years so similarly look at floor of the mouth is again very low 30 percent buccal mucosa 15 percent retromolar 30 percent uh, gingiva and lips seem to have a better um, prognosis so hence what we're trying to tell you here is that oral cancer has a poor five-year survival rate and hence early diagnosis can mean that the patient can have a better uh, prognosis so overall if you were to look at the deaths around the world for head and neck cancers it's mostly concentrated here in the indian subcontinent and some places in south asia um, and of course places in africa so if, what means to say is that there is a very heavy tobacco usage in these areas making uh, this area more vulnerable to uh, head and neck cancer deaths here in malaysia look at the picture of oral cancer uh, the national cancer registry uh, in 2005, oral cancer the, in buccal mucosa and other sites, including lip and tongue, is ranked 22nd and 15th most common in males and females in peninsular Malaysia. Uh, whereas for Indian females alone, it is ranked as third most common cancer among Malaysian Indians. Tongue cancer is ranked as seventh for Indian males. Uh, oral cancer among Indian males and females accounts to 4.5 to 6.5 respectively percent respectively of all cancers. Uh, indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak have the highest occurrence of precancerous and cancerous lesions after the Indians. Continuing with oral cancer in Malaysia, the incidence of oral cancer is highest in Indian females where the annual survival rate is just 10.2 per 10, 100,000 female population. Of those rip case reported with staging, only 35%, 35.4% of all cases were diagnosed as stage 1 and stage 2, which is very sad. That means the rest, that means nearly 65% of the population is diagnosed when they're already in stage 3 or stage 4. Oral diagnosis accounts for 11% of cancer deaths in Southeast Asia compared to only 4% of cancer deaths globally. So that means this percentage must be much higher for the Indian subcontinent. 
In Malaysia itself, statistics show that two persons are diagnosed with oral cancer every day. Unfortunately, due to the lack of awareness, 75% of them seek treatment at the late stage. In Malaysia, about 50% of patients survive less than two years, which meant that half of the oral cancer patients surviving today will no longer be, be alive two years down the road. So that is something for you to think about and uh, <coughs> how, it, how important it is to diagnose it at an early stage. Looking at the brighter side, there is a lot of research happening in Malaysia uh, for oral cancer. There is a vaccine which the Cancer Research of Malaysia is working on, uh, immunotherapy which is a vaccine to prevent oral cancer uh, and this is still under development. You can go to their website to have a better idea of what is happening and how you can be a part of this. There is a smartphone app which has been de uh, devised also to detect oral cancer using uh, Artificial intelligence, which is called as Oncogrid, uh, more on the website if you would want to know more uh, uh, interesting facts about this, as well as mobile mouth screening anywhere, which is called as Mimosa. It is a telemedicine and uh, is available in low le low income countries where, let's say, you as a doctor who is posted uh, or, or uh, a student who's posted in a far off uh, remote area having less access to qualified specialists could just use this app screen the lesion and probably post pictures where someone else sitting somewhere in a in a more advanced uh, area could tell you what you should do next should the patient go for biopsy do you need more pictures do you need a blood test and so on so that is how this mobile app works so these are some of the more uh, more promising uh, areas in cancer research and i would like you to go through the website go through these uh, and look what you find regarding them and read about it it, it gives you and, and you could join them you could you could be a part of the cancer research malaysia and oral cancer uh, team to see how you could help so that's part one of this chapter uh, more we will discuss in the next chapter and the next concluding part regarding treatment and complications we'll also look at some case studies so um, this, this is the end of the part one thank you